your weighted forecasts in the deal pipeline. You're going to see all your closed one revenue. And then you'll see a forecast submission if your reps are manually submitting forecasts. The right side is what's new. And so this is our AI forecast. So we're going to give you three benchmarks, a most likely number that really sits in the middle, and then an upper and lower threshold. The first time we give you these metrics is the first, after the first seven days of the month, once we've gotten um, close rates that were historical from previous months. So this is all based off the inputs and the accuracy that your team is forecasting at. So you just want to make sure that when your reps are inputting deals, they're setting the right close date, they're updating their data so that it's feeding our AI mo model accordingly. And then what's cool if you scroll down is you can see um, the forecast accuracy over time because we're going to recalibrate this every seven days based on updates to the pipeline. And you'll even get this percentage accuracy number that you can see right here. Um, my accuracy numbers are pretty low percentage. So the higher the percentage, the more accurate it is. This is all demo data. Um, but you can see right here, I have about a 75 to 78% accuracy. So, you know, the AI forecast came at around 316,000 average and we closed about 300,000. So again, it's just an additional data point to complement your forecasting today. And it's definitely something I've heard customers that are evaluating HubSpot um, or prospects that are evaluating HubSpot want and, and see in the market. Any questions or feedback, feel free to put this in the chat. And with that, I will move on to the next update which is another sales update. I promise marketers I'll, I'll get to the marketing platform as well. Um, but we also are going to give a predictive deal score. So we have lead score in HubSpot. We have company score in HubSpot that really predict the likelihood or quality of those leads and companies. And we really wanted to make the same for a deal. So instead of sales reps having to go in a deal and assess manually, hey, how much activity have I had? Is this going to close? Um, we're just gonna give you a score. And so you can use this in things like workflows or filters to really prioritize your top priority deals. So right here, I just created this filter, a lot of 57s in there. Again, this is demo data, but um, really helpful just first glance. Again, this is going to complement probably your pipeline management efforts. It's just that additional data point to get a good understanding of what deals you should be prioritizing and even maybe setting up workflows accordingly once maybe the deal score hits a certain threshold. Any questions? I'm curious for any like sales folks on the call, if they've seen this or, or would find this valuable. All right. Well, I will move on to the next update here and give marketers some value. Um, Multi-step forms. This is something that I feel like marketers have been asking for a really long time. Our forms tool is really great, um, but it historically hasn't had the most flexibility. And so um, we've actually given you the ability to create multi-step forms to create a more interactive experience for your visitors. Um, sometimes when you see a form that's really long, we, you know, visitors see it and they're like not going to fill it out. And of course, you know, we recommend to keep our form shorter. Um, but taking a more incremental approach to these multi-step forms can also um, really help conversions as well. So I'm going to show you what the back end looks like here. Um, and this is in private beta here to answer Curran's question about, is it live already? The forecasting and deal score should be in public beta. So if you go in your portal, I believe you can get opted in. This is in private beta still. So it shouldn't be accessible in your portals yet. Um, but this is what it looks like on the back end here. So you can see it's kind of a vertical experience. I added email properties as the first step in my form. You can go ahead and add a step right here. And then in this specific example, I have another property that says, you know, how many times a month do you want to be contacted? And what would you like to hear from us? So pretty simple drag and drop editor to continue to add these questions here. Um, you'll see on the left-hand side, this is a pretty, pretty identical experience to creating forms today. So you wanna drag your field in here and update the options. And so what this looks like on the front end here, if I fill in my email, 
I say once a week, type in some feedback, and then click submit. Um, so really fun. I think there was a question in the chat of why the horizontal scrolling and will each form set be saved upon submission? Really good questions. Um, so the way that our product team has created the UI is because the experience of the visitor is going to be clicking next and horizontal, um, I guess that's the way they thought the UI would be intuitive. However, because it's still in beta, they're definitely going to be gathering feedback. So, you know, if more of our customers are saying, hey, we don't like the horizontal, we want to keep it more vertical, um, definitely we'll listen to that feedback. In terms of if each form step is saved upon submission, that's a great question. It isn't. So the user will still have to go through every step of the form in order to convert to that lead. Um, it's really just built to create a more interactive experience than to, you know, create the lead just from like one or two properties versus the full form. Um, again, this is still in beta. So there's definitely going to be improvements based on feedback. For timeline, um, I don't believe we have a set timeline or can disclose that. It's in private beta right now. So my assumption would be that it should be in public beta probably by the end of this quarter, like end of March, beginning of April. Um, but yes, I see the point of each step being vertical because it is a lot, it can probably get to a lot of scrolling. Um, so these are also things that I can take to the product team as well. I think there's a small subset of customers that are in this private beta. So this is kind of just V1 of that, that update. Awesome. I'm loving the engagement here. All right. So back, back to some sales tools value. I think we've revamped our sales hub a lot. This is a product that's actually live. So I'm curious to hear from the sales folks on the call if they've been using this. But the reason I wanted to show it in this beta's um, presentation is it's still really new and there's a lot that's in beta within the prospecting workspace. It was a huge launch of ours. Um, so what you're looking at here is our prospecting workspace. Again, it's really built for our sales users, but like for marketers on the call that might be you know, partnering with sales teams that are using something like a Salesforce or an outreach or a sales loft enablement tools. This is actually pretty similar um, to some of the sales tools you might be using today. And the real value, of course, is that it's sitting under one platform. Um, so this is going to be the one-stop shop for a sales rep to log in in the morning, drink their morning cup of coffee, and understand what they should prioritize for the day. Before the prospecting workspace, we had a couple different places you could do this. They could go to their task queue. They could go to their deal pipeline, their contact lists. Um, but they still have to go to a couple different places to understand their calendar for their day, their tasks, how to action on contacts. So this is a much easier and intuitive way to streamline their efforts. So as you can see, I have all my tasks due for the day, anything overdue. If I scroll down, I'll see any sales engagement campaigns, so sequences that are currently enrolled. And we're also surfacing up this suggested activities, which is new. It's not quite AI-based, but we'll analyze your data on HubSpot and surface up any activities that we would recommend. So for example, if you've logged a call or a meeting without an outcome, if you've been assigned a new lead but there's no contact, if you've disqualified a lead, but they've re-engaged with you and you haven't contacted them, what will surface those activities to make it really easy to connect with your prospects. You can see right here, I can view my schedule. And then we also have the concept of a leads object. Um, I could spend another 10 minutes on this, so I'm going to keep it really high level, but essentially it's a better way for our sales folks to keep track of people that they've connected with. Maybe marketing's passed them a really good lead and now they have to follow up. Um, and so what that really looks like under this leads tab is just a more intuitive way to track the different stages of that lead. Feedback we've gotten from sales customers before is, hey, we get we can have, you know, a, um, a like, property to track the lead status, but we actually want to see like how much time has passed, similar to how you can get reporting in a deal pipeline by a deal stage. Um, so I think this will be really beneficial and just easier for sales reps to track as well as view next activity. And you'll notice when I click on the contact, you'll see the different lead stages as well as the amount of time they were a lead. 
And this was something we couldn't do before. Um, so also definitely more familiar to other like sales enablement tools out there like Outreach and Sales Loft. And then of course you can see your schedule with your calendar connected and your sales feed. So again, giving that one-stop shop for our sales customers on the call, definitely give this a try. Um, and for any you know marketers on the call that know of their sales teams that might be using other sales enablement tools that aren't integrated with HubSpot, really easy way to kind of bridge that marketing sales gap. We did get a question, Ellie. Um, what's the best way to pass feedback on some of these tools, like as we're as people are using them? Yeah, great question. So within the HubSpot UI, um, if you if you can opt into the beta, again, some of the betas I'm showing you today are in private, so you don't have access to opt in yet. Um, there should be a help or there should be a pop up that says beta and there should be a pop up that asks for feedback. Um, however, that might be a good call to action from this this session. Like I've already heard some good feedback about the multi-step forms and the horizontal versus vertical. So I can also surface this feedback directly to our product team. It might just be quicker and more organic. Um, so I'll, I'll like man the chat as well, um, but also within the UI, there should be some places to submit that. Cool, good questions. Um, I will move on from the prospecting workspace and give Service Hub some love for any of our service folks on the call. Um, we now offer skill-based ticket routing for help desk emails. Um, we have gotten a um, lot of feedback basically from, from more Zendesk users or people that are using more sophisticated service that we haven't offered skill-based ticket routing in the past. And this is really important for specific specialized service teams. Um, you could even probably use it for sales teams if you have teams that are global and speak different languages or have certain specialties within sales. Um, but essentially what you can do is you can create all the different skills your team has within these settings right here. So you'll notice that a lot of them are language based, really easy to create a skill. So you're going to say user skill put in the skill name there, and it's going to show up on this list where you can manage everything. And then you can go to your users and teams and really easily assign users different skills. So if I want to go to Annie's and I want to give her a skill that says, okay, English or Spanish, right? I can add as many skills as I want. And then I can set up routing accordingly. Um, so I'll show you where I am in the tool right here. This is in our routing section of the settings. That is, this is still in public beta to answer your question, Maya. This is a service hub future, just to clarify, and it is an enterprise. So depending on your package, um, depends on your like accessibility essentially. Um, but right here, you'll see where you're gonna maintain all of these different rules. So in this instance, I created a rule to say, if they're an English speaker, and then if the ticket has a country code that is any of England, and again, you can use any filters in the ticket object as well as any associated object to create your criteria for which team you would route to for the skill. So I'm gonna go ahead and save that and then say if their country code on the ticket is any of England, then route to our English speaking uh, skills based team. And you can also pair this with the existing teams that you have in HubSpot. Um, and then you go ahead and save that. And it's just a really easy and scalable way to do routing for service teams. Prior to this update, I feel like there would be workflows in different places or you'd have to like remove people in the conversation inbox settings. Again, this is just an easier way to maintain um, some of those teams. And we found from prospects and customers alike that it's a lot more aligned with what they'd expect coming over from something like a Zendesk. Um, so yeah, hopefully you find this helpful. Um, and yeah, I think the only question was, is this in public beta? And it should be in public beta. So you should have access if you are on Service Hub Enterprise. The other piece of this for our Service Hub folks here is, Help desk in general is a revamp of our conversations inbox and is no longer in beta, but it is brand new. Um, so this is kind of an addition to that that beta. We're really trying to improve um, and scale our, our service hub. All right. 
Oh, it actually looks like it has since gone live. So it should be live and no longer in public beta. All right, so this is a pretty agnostic update. It might be really exciting for some of you HubSpot admins out there, um, but we now have a new analytics tab for user activity. Oftentimes I'll get admins or managers asking, hey, how can I understand my adoption rate once I'm onboarding to HubSpot? Or how can I understand my adoption rate in general and who's logging in and out of HubSpot, what tools they're using? Prior to this, we didn't have the best tools to do so. There was an audit log in HubSpot where you could see what users were logging in, but it didn't give you as much visibility. Um, so now within the audit log settings, we have this new analytics view. So you can see the total daily logins, deletions and exports, really important. And you can even see user activity by category to understand like where in the tool your users are spending the most time. If you scroll down here, what I think is really cool is you can see the user activity by action. Um, so if you have a lot of deletions, for example, and you've seen them skyrocketing, there might be a trend that you want to look at as an admin. Um, you know, how many people are publishing things, creating new records, et cetera, just gives you that high level glance, especially as you scale and bring more teams and users onto HubSpot. And then you scroll down, we're also um, giving you this by serum object type. Um, so, you know, maybe if you're not using the tickets objects as much, but you just onboarded to Service Hub, you want to see this number tick up and kind of trend over time. And as with any HubSpot report, you can obviously filter by date. So hopefully this is a game changer for some of you admins out there, people asking themselves the questions of like, what does my adoption look like? What, how am I trending over time for usage of the HubSpot tool? When I was a CSM at HubSpot, we actually had something similar to this like in the back end, but it was never this detailed and we never really shared it with customers. So hopefully this will help you understand too where you can get more value out of HubSpot and what tools you aren't using. All right. Could you please show us how to get to that page? Yes, absolutely. Um, so it's just under the audit logs. Um, so under here, under data management in settings, if I click audit logs, it's gonna bring you to this events tab right here. Um, that's gonna actually give you a log. So this is kind of one by one table if you wanna visualize it this way of user actions. But then if you click on this analytics tab, this is where you're gonna find the reports. And again, this should be in public beta. So if you don't see it in your portal, it should be accessible regardless of what package you're on. Definitely opt in. Um, and I'll show you at the end of this session too how you can opt into new betas within your own portal for those of you that haven't seen the new update. All right, circling back to marketing. Um, how many of you run offline marketing events, things like trade shows or in-person conferences. Feel free to just drop it in the chat if you do. Okay, awesome. Great. Um, you can be totally honest here, but I feel like HubSpot historically has not been as easy of a solve for offline event management. Historically, we've been able to integrate with great digital webinar platforms, things like HubSpot, GoToWebinar. But oftentimes when customers or prospects would ask me like, you know, how do I manage this offline event? I would tell them, import the list into HubSpot, send them an email, and maybe you can attach that list to a report to understand um, the success of your efforts. But we're now actually giving a lot more love to offline events, um, and we're giving you your own kind of object to maintain what this event will look like. So how this flow is going to go is you're going to run your offline event, and obviously because it's offline, you're, you're likely going to have people in a list in, in a spreadsheet, right? So you're going to import those leads into HubSpot. Um, but to start, you can actually create an offline marketing event in HubSpot. And I will show you how I got here. Um, so when I go to actually contacts and then the contacts index page, I'm going to go under the contacts index menu, I'll see all my custom objects, and I'll also see this new marketing events object. And this is native to HubSpot, so you should see it in your portal. When you click on the marketing events, you'll see that I have some integrated webinar events that are coming from GoToWebinar, Webinar, Zoom webinar, but also now you can create a marketing event 
for your in-person. So you'll have your, your name, your description, your start and end date. So I created this trade show, for example. And once that event is created, I actually have the ability to import event contacts directly to this um, event object. So you'll see that I have in my spreadsheet people that registered, canceled, and attended. Again, this is demo data, so I would hope that no one's events look like this. Um, but again, this is just a really easy, more intuitive way to view your offline events. And of course, you can drill into who's registered, and you can even see what campaigns you're associating this to. Um, so this brings me to my next point. It's going to be a lot easier to report on the success of your offline events and pair them with some of your digital efforts. So for those of you marketers familiar with the campaigns tool or maybe the marketing attribution tool, you're able to add an asset that's called a marketing event that can represent some of your offline events. Again, prior to this, um, you know, we, we might recommend, hey, just import the static list, attach it to the event. And that, there was nothing necessarily wrong with that, but it just wasn't the best intuitive way to track some of those offline events. This gives you a much better visual and a much easier way to kind of understand as a marketer, like this is a marketing event, this was offline, I can easily report on this. I see that there's some questions in the chat. Does the offline object also have an API? Yes, so this marketing events object does have an endpoint, our marketing events endpoint. So if you did track your offline events or online events in another custom system, you could use our API to create um, these events and pull over the registrants. Um, we use this API for a pre-built integration that we have. If any of you are using Zoom webinar, GoToWebinar, um, Eventbrite, those are these can natively pull over if you're using some of those um, webinar integrations, but you can absolutely use our custom API as well. And then um, why is this a different object for behavioral events? Great question. And once you connect webinars to marketing events, it would not let me add any actual offline event data. Um, yeah, so a couple of great questions. I'll start with the first of the offline event data. Um, if you are integrating with like a webinar or a digital um, event management platform, that's going to automatically sync from like a go-to webinar and that's going to be the source of truth. So that might be why it's not letting you additionally import contacts once you already have a digital event in here. It's because um, we see them as two separate things. We're going to give you the ability to import event contacts for those offline events because that's where you're managing. But if you already have a webinar platform we're connecting with, that's going to more so be your source of truth. Um, and then, oh, there was a question about, yeah, this versus behavioral events. That's a really good question. Um, so for behavioral events, it's a little bit difficult to track offline, I would say, with behavioral events, technically speaking, because for that custom behavioral event, we're going to have to pull from an API or from the front end so that that event still needs to be like hosted somewhere that we're calling to. Um, oftentimes when we speak with our customers and they're tracking offline events, they're not really tracking it anywhere other than like pen and paper or a spreadsheet. So using the custom behavioral events API, we wouldn't actually be able to get the offline event data anywhere because it's not living anywhere. It's living in spreadsheets. So that's like one reason why marketing events would be better and easier, um, as well as just visualization. You know, we've gotten more and more customers asking, how do we better manage events in HubSpot? We want it to be really intuitive. So this just gives a more specific and granular ability to manage events versus custom events can really be anything. And, and you can certainly use that for flexibility. Um, it's really just going to be use case dependent. And then I have a question from Keith. Will you be able to eventually associate tickets to the object? Hmm. That's a really good question. I can check if it's on our roadmap, but I'm, I don't think it is right now. Keith, I would love to hear kind of your use case for associating tickets to this object. I would say at first glance, it would be like if your registrants have an open ticket, then you'd be able to see that they attended the event on their contact record, right? And then you'd be able to see that they're associated with a ticket. So that's how I'd recommend kind of seeing both, you know, tickets as well as event information. Um, but feel free to throw more of a use case in the chat for that because I can also pass that along to our product team. Love the engagement here. We build all our marketing events as a ticket. Okay. Yeah. So I think in the past, maybe that would be a good workaround since we didn't have the marketing events object. 
Um, so I think there's a couple options there. You could transition to start using the marketing events, um, depending on your ticket volume and what that migration would look like. Um, but I think at the moment, we probably won't associate the two natively. And Paul, yeah, seeing which contracts who have registered events, but also have open tickets would be useful. Yeah, absolutely. And just to clarify, right, like if I do go to this contact here that sign up, you will see their marketing event activity on the timeline. So pre, I think someone asked about the custom behavioral events that I addressed. It's going to show up just like a, um, a custom behavioral event on the timeline. So it actually is visualized the same as a, as a custom behavioral event. I think it's just easier to set up and maintain. And then, yeah, if they did have an open ticket, you would see that right here. So because the event registration lives on the contact record, you technically can see all those associations. And yes, Paul, events are accessible for lists. So I would recommend creating lists for your events. And then, of course, you can use those in workflows. Great questions here. A lot of love for this, for this marketing events. Um, yeah, I'm glad you guys are seeing value in it and using it. I feel like it's just something that wasn't rolled out or we didn't market as much, but it definitely is helpful for the customers that I have heard using it. All right. And um, we do have a, a few questions that have come through um, in the Q&A. Okay. Yeah. Um, one is, can you speak more to connecting the marketing events beta to webinar platforms? Is the only integration right now go to webinar? Yeah, good question. Nope. So we have a couple of integrations. We have Zoom webinar, GoToWebinar, and I believe Eventbrite. Um, we are going to be adding more native integrations, but those are our top three. And then, as I mentioned before, we do have an API for the marketing events. So if you had a custom event system or another event system that we don't have a native integration for, you could still use that API to integrate with your webinar tool. Um, and then Andres was asking about um, where to find the events tab. And that was just going through the contacts drop down, right? Exactly. Yeah. So real quick, one more time, if you go to contacts and then the contacts drop down, if you go to the contacts drop down, you'll see marketing events under here and then you'll see the index page. Perfect. Awesome. Any more questions? Um, I think we're caught up. Cool. Love the engagement. All right, um, so our next is another service hub update. Dependent fields in custom surveys. Do we have any folks in the room using surveys in our service hub tool today? Because I bet that if you are, you've wanted this update previously. Um, as all of you know, the shorter the survey, the more likely someone is to fill it out. You want to get all the data that you need, but if you don't have the ability to create dependent fields, that makes it really hard. So this is kind of a table stakes future that we finally have rolled out. Um, so in order to demo it, should be right here. Awesome. So I built this survey. Um, and I'm going to show you the preview of it, but the user experience is pretty much the same as building another survey. I can't edit right now because I've published the survey, but when I go ahead and preview the survey, you'll notice that I just hosted an event. I want to get feedback on it. I asked one question, um, but I'm going to get two or three answers just based on this one field. So I'll ask, what did you love about our event? If I choose food or drink, it's going to ask what food or drink I liked. If I selected the keynote speakers was my favorite part about the event, then it's going to change and ask me which speakers I liked. So again, you're going to get like two or three data points of feedback, um, but really starting with just that one question. Previous to this, you probably would have had to have four fields that said, what did you love about our event? If you love this, then ask what speakers were your favorite, et cetera. So it just creates a better experience for some of your um, people that are taking your survey. All right, and I see Keith also put in the use case for the event and ticket object. So um, hopefully we can get a chat of this history or Dustin, you can pass that info along to me. Um, but hopefully this is a game changer for people that are creating surveys. Um, this is functionality that's specifically built into our custom surveys right now. 
Um, so not for things like ENPS and the out-of-the-box surveys. Um, but again, feedback is welcome. This is still technically in public beta. Any questions? I feel like this is a future we needed for a long time, so I'm excited about it. All right. So that was the end of our kind of fun, flashy, more obvious updates. These are updates that I would consider, you know, kind of more silent rollouts or kind of flying under the radar, but I think are going to be really valuable and important. So I'll start with CRM email permissions. I don't know if anyone on this call has asked if we can set permissions by a sales email. And I want to clarify, this is a sales email, not a marketing email. Uh, but as you know, in HubSpot, you can connect your inbox if you're a sales user and you can email, um, log those emails to HubSpot. And previous to this update, it was an all or nothing permission. So if you had permission to view a contact, you had permission to view every single email engagement that was logged to the record. And this was problematic for a couple of reasons. There were a ton of pain points. Um, teams that had, um, or companies that had different global teams that might be you know, reaching out to the same contact, or maybe they had multiple brands and they were reaching out to the same contact and there were multiple sales reps or account managers. They still wanted to share the same contact and see their marketing email engagement. They want to see the same fields. But if I'm a sales rep and I'm sharing this contact with someone, I don't want them to see my email engagement, but I still want them to access the record. Um, or I could be a sales rep that's emailing my prospects, but maybe I have a really cool strategy and I don't want my other sales reps to see because I'm really competitive. But I want them to be able to see the contact records in case, um, again, they want to see some of the basic, you know, high level information on that contact. So this just gives more granular permissions so that you can set um, the permissions to say, you know, you can view all CRM emails. You can only view CRM emails that you own or that you send. And then you can only view CRM emails that the team owns. So when I go into my settings here, You'll see, and this is actually, we've revamped our settings, so the UI might also look different if you haven't been in here in a while anyways. But when you scroll down here, um, viewing emails that are sent on a contact timeline, now you can go granular to say, only let me view the CRM emails that I own or that my team owns. And yes, Ricky, good point. You can finally get leaders to connect their emails. It's always a touchy subject and... Um, Oftentimes reps get nervous of like, oh, all my emails are going to get logged. Everyone can see them. Everyone can have visibility. Sometimes there's a use case for that. And sometimes, you know, you want to get really granular with, with your permissions, um, especially as you grow as an org. So I think this is really important. I've heard feedback about this a lot. The other more sales specific update is creating deal pipeline rules. Um, not super glamorous. Again, it's really just a settings thing, but I think it's going to be a game changer specifically because um, of data cleanliness for sales reps, right? So when sales reps are creating deals, sometimes they, they might skip stages um, or they might move stages backwards. And this can make it really hard for reporting because um, you, you previously didn't have the guardrails to say, no, you need to create a deal and start in this stage. You can't start at the third stage or you can't move deals backwards, but there wasn't a guardrail in place to actually enforce that behavior. It was really just training the reps, which is always hard. Um, so by pipeline, you can set some of these pipeline rules to have more control over how you're managing your deals. Um, and the impact, of course, is really gonna be in that reporting as well. When you're looking at deal conversion rates, um, they're not gonna be kind of all over the place. You're gonna get just more accurate data that's reflective of your sales process. Any questions about the last two updates? Deal pipeline rules is live now. So all you folks that have Sales Hub should see access. All right. Conditional form to URL routing. Um, so I'm curious if anyone on this call has come across this challenge, but I've gotten questions from customers of, can we create smart content and route based off of form submission? And previous to this update, our smart content was great for things like sending emails or visitors coming to your website pages, but we couldn't in real time create a smart content um, routing page based off of form submission because HubSpot couldn't process those form fields quick enough in the CRM to then 
surface up the right page. Um, it just didn't work for smart content. But we know this is a huge need for customers to create a personalized experience for their users. So we finally have this conditional form to URL routing. So what this means is based on someone filling out specific aspects of a form, it's going to route to a different page accordingly. And this could be like a page, it could be a meetings link, um, but essentially the settings are right here. And you'll see, I'm just back in, to show you how I got here, I'm back in my forms tool. I'm actually gonna go back to confirm the name of this form. Um, and so once you go to the form and you go to the options right here, you'll have the ability to set up routing rules. Um, so you can route it to a specific rep scheduling page. So if you have certain reps that work in certain territories and on the form field, you have like what country or region are you in? What city are you in? You can route to a specific reps schedule, um, but you can also route to a specific page as well. So these are my four form fields. Um, depending on what fields you have in your form, those will be accessed in the drop down here. And then you can create that logic. So in this example, I said, if the country or region is any of the Bahamas, then please redirect to this scheduling page. You can also redirect to a HubSpot page if you have like a specific thank you page or maybe like a blog um, or an external URL if you're not using HubSpot's landing pages and blogs. So again, I think this will be a big game changer, especially when we talk about meetings. Like I know if any of you are using Chili Piper, they have this real-time routing that makes it really easy for sales teams to route to reps in real time. Um, so again, just creating a more, a more personalized experience. And this should be live in your portals today. Awesome. Lots of conditional updates. Um, conditional property options for HubSpot defined properties. So you hopefully saw this update or caught up to it now, but we previously, I think in the past couple of months, have rolled out conditional property fields in HubSpot. So what that means is if you fill out a field on the contact record, then maybe another field is surfaced that's required. That really helps with data cleanliness, maintaining a good database, and also just giving your reps a really you know, direct experience of what information they should be filling out. But we took it a step further, and now we actually have conditional property options for properties. So what that means is the options and values under one property could change based off of the answer or value of another property. So to give you an example, because it's kind of confusing, if someone fills out a field for the deal pipeline is any of sales, then for the deal type field, only show new business. If they say, hey, the deal pipeline is any of e-commerce, then maybe the deal type field would only show orders. So it basically changes the options and values of one field based off the answers of another. And I'm going to go through another use case that I've actually heard directly from customers um, right here. So let's say I'm on a ticket record right here, as you can see in HubSpot. Um, let's say that I have a couple of different support issues. So technical, billing, troubleshooting. And if I click the technical issue is the category, then as you can see, I have three different options for what this specific technical issue could be. So maybe it's wiring or setup. But if I select billing for the support issue, my only options are going to be back end. So not only does it create an easier experience for people that are filling out these fields because it's giving the options that they should have access to, not just like, 10 options that are out in the wild. Um, but it's also going to help you get the right data on HubSpot versus giving every user the option to fill out every single option. Um, so you can get really creative with these. I think they're kind of more niche use cases, but hopefully you can um, find value in this. And this is also on any specific object. And what the experience looks like from the back end. So I'm in a property right now. Um, as you can see, it is the technical issues property. And that's the property that's values are going to change based off of if someone filled out a support issue. So if the support issue is technical, then give the user all three options. But if they fill out billing, I only want them to be able to fit um, the back end. 
And for troubleshooting, I only want them to access wiring. So again, helping you get really creative as an admin. Um, will the conditional property options be enforced with the API? Great question, Walter. At this time, I do not believe so. But because this is, again, so new and in beta, I could see that maybe in three to six months down the line. And I can definitely service that to our product team as well. All right. There was also a question of does conditional, uh, does the conditional properties extend to the call object? Mm, it does not. It's for our standard objects right now. Um, I'm curious the use case though. So would it be like if someone selects a certain call outcome, then only show specific meeting types? Something along those lines. Because I could see a use case for that. And I do know that we've gotten feedback before of like changing the call type options based off the outcome. So definitely something I can surface to our product team, but feel free to also throw like a specific use case in the chat so I can pass that along. All right, any more questions? All right, so we have one more product update left, and then I'm going to show you where in the tool you can opt into some of these betas um, and kind of next steps if you have any feedback. I've already heard such helpful feedback on the call, um, but you know, happy to create more of a standard way to do that after this webinar. Um, so the last update is going to be products purchased from a contact or company record. So this is really helpful, probably more for specific verticals that are selling products, but also services if you're using our line items tool. Um, previously, if you went to a contact or company record, if you wanted to see the products that were associated with this contact or company, you had to go to the deal record and then you would see on the deal record, the line items. So for example, I'm on a con Lena's contact record right now. And if I wanted to see all her products, I used to have to go into a deal so a separate page to view this. Now, if I scroll down here, there's actually a module that will give product history of the associated deals and associated line items of that contact or company. Um, so much easier way on one page to view some of this activity. So anyone using our line items tool or using the line items API to pull in products or services from another tool, just a better user experience to be able to view this data. And I'll also, while I'm here, shamelessly plug our new middle pane for our contact record. Um, there's been a lot of updates to how you can customize and extend records in HubSpot. And so I'm sure most of you have seen some of this, um, but you can create now custom tabs, which probably six to eight months ago wasn't um, available. And you can also add certain modules for some of these tabs. So things like reporting, recommended tasks, lifecycle stage tracking, as well as anything custom that might come from other systems. Um, so again, like I would say maybe a year ago, none of this was possible. You really weren't able to customize this layout. I think as we're moving towards a more, you know, comprehensive, sophisticated CRM, we're gonna give you those options and still keep it simple and easy to use but also really powerful. So just wanted to plug that as well. And the product history tab is one of the newer modules that we've released. Okay, awesome. So Keith, it looks like you in the private beta for this. Um, it would be great to filter by I think certain dates of purchases. That is great feedback um, that I can take. You can filter by deal stage today, but you're right. There's not a lot of other options for things like dates or specific products. And then how much of this is versus pro or enterprise versus pro? Kathy asked. Um, so the flexibility of some of these out of the box modules um, should be, and I can double check because I think it might differ based off module, is pro. Um, but there is some customization and, and these tabs too should be available in pro, but the, the more customized, like connecting different systems, creating your own custom modules, I believe is an enterprise feature for our sales and service hub enterprise customers. All right. Any more questions before I show the team how to um, opt into betas within their account? 
All right. So within your HubSpot account here, you have the drop down menu that gives you the ability to see all this different information here, your billing, getting help. When you go to this product updates section here, you'll see all of the different things that we have in development and beta that are coming soon in live. So a great way to stay great way to stay updated on all of the product updates and you can see that you'll have the ability to join specific betas. So if you click that, you enroll, you agree to the HubSpot beta terms and then you get access directly in your portal. So no more reaching out to your customer success manager or HubSpot chat. Um, this is all kind of self-service here. All right. Well, that was all I had for product updates and it looks like we have eight minutes left. I appreciate all of the involvement, feedback, questions, um, and happy to take any more questions if, if there's anything outstanding. That was awesome, Ali. Uh, some of those things I didn't even know existed. Um, so that's exciting to, to see that progress. Awesome. Love it. Uh, yeah, it's hard to keep up with all the updates. There's a lot of them. I, I get in there as much as I can. And uh, somebody on our team also does a really good job of paying attention to those. Um, but it, it does come fast and furious. For sure. Um, there was a question on the conditional properties. Um, mm -hmm. Is that live in portals or is that is that in beta? The conditional properties should be live. Um, and it is a pro or enterprise feature. So as long as you have one of those two subscriptions. Awesome. Yeah. And if you don't see any of these options in your portal and you've double checked that you have like the right subscription level, um, definitely make sure that if you go to the product updates, what I just showed you that it still hasn't like gone back to a private beta or something. If they're live, that shouldn't happen. Um, but yeah, you can always contact our support team too if you don't see this in your portal. I think I have a question from Walter. The public beta for Magic Key authentication is only for service, but the portal is also marketing use. Can we request? So Walter, just to clarify, you're saying you have a service and marketing subscription, or I think I might need a little clarification on that question. Unless Dustin, you understand. I'm not sure either. Okay. And yeah, in terms of like how to surface product feedback, I already went over this of how you should be able to do it in the portal, um, but I'll take some notes from this webinar today. And then um, I'm not sure Dustin, if, my email is attached to this invite or if they have access. Um, but I'm also happy to give out my email as well. And so if you don't have the opportunity to give this feedback in portal, I would love to collect it and give that directly to our product team just so it gets in the right hands. Yeah, there you go. A Clifford at HubSpot.com. So okay. Walter's saying that it's a marketing only portal um, and the public key is a great addition, but doesn't seem to be available. Got it. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure like public key or magic key, what, what update you're referring to maybe like, I don't know if you're talking about the private apps, new authentication method, but Walter, you can always shoot me an email. Um, and we can take this offline too, just so I get a better understanding. All right. Awesome. All right. Um, I think that looks good. Um, Thank you everyone for joining. Um, Ali, this was awesome. Uh, I love these hugs that have have homework for us to go play around with. So I'm excited to go dive into some of these. 
Um, Kate on our team has probably already started diving into these things. So um, excited to get to work there. I appreciate everyone taking the time out of your days to your day to join us. Um, we will have this recording, so it'll be well in an email following up. Also on that same page that you registered, um, it'll live there as well. Um, Ali's email is in the, the chat if you want to grab that and have any questions for her. Um, but Ali, again, really appreciate it. Great job. Um, exciting, exciting stuff coming out this year. Absolutely. It's just getting started. Yeah, I appreciate everyone's time. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks.